Hello, everyone. Uh, today we're here. We're very lucky. We're here with uh, Margot van Sleitman. Thank Did you. I pronounce it properly? You got it all right. Because uh, I'm Spanish, so I don't say things right sometimes. Uh, uh, many of you will know Margot. She's uh, written uh, extensively about her personal experience and uh, your your flagship, um, or by what people know you say, your Sabona. Uh, what, what's it? Is it is an experience? Is it? Can you define it? Yes, yes. Sabona is a Zulu word, and it means I see you. Um, the way that I use it, firstly, it is the title of my of my master's thesis, so Sabona, Justice as Lived Experience. Mm -hmm. It is the title of my book about meeting the man who murdered my father. He is the person that taught me the word. So, in essence, it is a framing, it's a framing for restorative justice. It's a way of saying we see each other, you know, we respect each other, we are in relationship with each other, we are responsible with and for and to each other. However, Sabona is sort of broader. It's just a broader, almost a philosophical, one of my, um, my thesis supervisors said to me, Sabona is a new justice theory. So it is a way of articulating justice within a crucible that is quite inclusive, quite inclusive. And it's it's the essence of our humanity, who we are. You are human. I am human. Well, I suppose that it makes sense as well. Uh, you know, in small communities, uh, where things happen inevitably, and you have to live with the people within the community because uh, it's a small community. You cannot banish people, or you cannot just go around killing Killing. Those that uh, no. <laughs> uh, <commit> offenses. <laughs> that would be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah. um, I think that it seems interesting in the sense that. Uh, uh, it almost tells you that you live in a in a close community where it's a close system you know our planet and you live with the people that you live around with and they're there and you have to deal with things yes. and that's it isn't it and you have different ways of dealing with it one of them is obviously uh, inspired by uh, being able to forgive and to understand and what you mentioned I see you uh, you know I acknowledge the fact that something has happened and you're there so let's uh, deal with it I appreciate what you say, that we live within a small community, and then you say we are on the planet. I think I think that's a profound insight, and it is a paradox in a sense, because you would think that the world is so big, you know, but Sabona means that no matter who you are and where you are, that I can, I can understand the fact that we do live with mystery, and that we live with paradox, and we live with profound pain and profound joy, you know, in the case of my father being murdered in Canada, nine years after we moved from what used to be British Guyana, South America, mm -hmm. you know, we went to Canada for a better and a safer life. So, you know, we went from this part of the planet to this part of the planet, and um, our lives were profoundly changed because of that. Sabona is a way of, of acknowledging the fact that no matter where we are, things will happen to us. No matter who we think we are, or people judge us to be, we are all on a particular journey. We're all on a journey. And within that journey, then we have ways of articulating how we deal with each other when we have the joy, and when we have things like murder and rape and being dismissed, being disrespected, and not only being, but also doing it to each other. Yeah. So Bona implies that we're all saints and sinners at the same time, mm -hmm. and that we can land somewhere in the middle. That's very interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna just say one thing. Uh, your thesis is actually on the restorative forum. I'll include the link uh, okay. when uh, this video is posted, and I will include a link as well to your books. So anyone interested, that uh, they're terribly interesting. I think you write poetry. It's not just R J, but it's poetry as well, yes. and you write all the kinds of stuff. Yes. So uh, we'll post it there so you can have a look. Um, I think it's quite interesting to to have a broad range of uh, registers if you like. But it's very good. I'm going to ask you now about something that we were discussing before. This word, okay. autoethnography. Okay. You mentioned it. I'm not too sure what it is, so I'm going to let you explain what it is. Okay. Autoethnography is a methodology that can be used in research, that is used in research. So people are often familiar with eth ethnography. So I want to write about restorative justice, so I will interview you, Miguel, mm -hmm. or other colleagues or other you know individuals that have that, that have been through this process auto ethnography is is using the it's a methodology whereby you use your own story 
to express a particular thesis, a particular point of view. Mm -hmm. So in my case, the title of my thesis, I mentioned it just now, but Sabona, Justice as Lived Experience. So I am speaking about restorative justice. I am unpacking it. And <clears throat> in so doing, or in order to do that, I use the story of my father's murder on March 27th, Easter Monday, 1978, in Scarborough, Ontario, Canada. I'm very specific about these dates sometimes. So autoethnography is a way of using one's own story, one's own experience to then elucidate a, a thesis, to bring out points about specific areas. In my case, my thesis is around two things. It's around restorative justice and around expressive or therapeutic writing. Mm -hmm. So that, that it's using your story for your for for your to frame your methodology essentially. I'm gonna ask you to explain that therapeutic uh, writing because it seems interesting. I think it's something that is perhaps not as widely known. But uh, does it have anything to do with uh, writing letters of apology? No. It can. What what it essentially is is this: therapeutic writing is um. It is writing to express your own pain your own grief, your own sorrow, your own sense of ennui. Um, so it's a way of digging into your soul to, to find voice to very complicated and painful things for you. So for example, the way that Glenn Flett, who killed Theodore Vance Lightman, found me is because he read about an award that I received from what's called the National Association for Poetry Therapy. I wrote a book called Dance With Your Healing, Tears Let Me Begin to Speak. I received an award for that book, and then I was invited to the United States to give a workshop on this book. And essentially, the people that were in my workshop were individuals, professors, teachers, poets, healers, psychologists, uh, sociologists, all kinds of people that, that understand that story, that voice, that being able to vomit via the pen on the page is a way to to make sense where there seems to be no sense and sometimes the making sense relates to actually still not understanding but still being able to say but i don't get it i'm not sure i mean a storm of emotions ideas yes and i must tell you i have always used poetry because <clears throat> poetry and literature and film have saved my life they've saved my life i have loved poetry because it's quick and it's expressive and so the writing, the, the writing therapy or the therapeutic writing um, is, is a way to, to break open and to bleed onto the page and to cry and then to come to a point where there is a, an essence of joy and possibility, you see. So that book that I wrote, I thought the last poem in that book is called Up From the Ashes. So it's about Phoenix rising you know, to ashes and then coming into life. Mm -hmm. I thought that I was finished with my dad's murder and my grief when that happened. When I was on the stage receiving the award and giving a talk about, you know, thanking people and all of this, I realized, Miguel, that I wasn't finished with my dad's, uh, my dad's murder. And that was in the year 2007, and daddy was murdered in 1978. And when I was on that stage, I felt his bullets in me. My dad was shot in his back, and he was shot right next to his heart. And I thought, when I, when I felt those bullets, I thought, you're not finished. Like, what? It's 20, it's almost 30 years later, what? And I swear to God, I went home and two days later, I got an email. I got an email from the wife of the man who murdered my father. And it was a donation. I have a tiny poetry press. And um, it was a donation to that press, Palabras, words press, you would know in yeah. Spanish. <laughs> so Palabras Press. So... What, what, what I find striking is the fact that writing to save my life, and I never told anybody why I did that kind of writing, mm -hmm. and then creating courses, you know, again, never telling anybody why I did it, that very writing became the very thing that essentially gave me my life back. Because when I met Glenn Flett, um, May, June, July, May, June, July, two months after his email came into me, I knew that my life had then... Been I, I became Phoenix. I rose from the ashes. 
I'm going to get back to that, to uh, Risen from Your Ashes, in a moment. But first, um, I wanted to, to highlight the fact that you're talking about dancing, crying, writing. It's like, um, you know, sometimes restorative justice can feel like something that is done to you. You know, an institution, an organization, a group of people doing restorative justice to other group of people yes. or to individuals. Whereas in your case, you're talking about doing restorative justice to yourself. Uh, hitting yes. yourself through writing, crying, yes. dancing, whatever it takes, yes. uh, which is a very interesting perspective because uh, it means that uh, sometimes, yes, uh, for certain cases, you do need to have the intervention of uh, uh, certain people or structures. You need them there to make sure that everything is safe and yes. is correct. Some of the times, for some of the t kinds of uh, situations, you have to do it yourself and uh, you don't need to invite anyone from outside. You just need to have some introspection do whatever you need to do, like you did in your case, write, cry, do whatever it is. Yes. Uh, so yes. it's a very interesting concept. You're using every part of your body and every, every part of your intellect yes. to heal yourself. Yes, and you know, the interesting thing is, this is where the Sabona piece <coughs> comes in. Firstly, I'm going to make this qualifier, and I know you know this, and probably most people listening will know this, but restorative justice, and even the wonderful and kind uh, Howard Zier, who wrote the foreword to my book, Sabona, a real-life restorative justice story, has written in Changing Lenses, he says, restorative justice is not exclusively about meeting the person who did you harm. That is one aspect. So that is the mediation. That, that is one aspect of restorative justice. Restorative justice is, is, is a process. It's a process. It's an invitation or conversation. You know, it's a, it's a practice, if you will in terms of how we negotiate justice, how we negotiate meaning. For me, Sabona speaks exactly that and more. So I Sabona myself. I look to Margot and I say, Margot, you are falling apart. You have lost meaning. How is it that you're going to find that? You know, and I do this work, the writing with inmates, with victims. I do the therapeutic writing and I give the talks all over the place, you know. And that's a whole part of it. It's not to say that necessarily you are going to meet the person that's caused you whatever degree of harm. When I'm disrespected, if somebody's ignoring me, that hurts my feelings. Yeah. How do I deal? If I'm in solitary confinement, how do I remember to say, okay, I Sabona myself, I matter, I see you, I see you, you know. And we don't like every aspect of ourselves, you see. So yes, yes, and it's it's... It, I love the work of restorative justice. I think it's powerful, and I believe that the people involved are extremely well-meaning and generous. My initial experience with it after I met Glenn was, for a time, we were castigated by, by some communities because we did not fill out the right forms. And I think that does, re <laughs> that does restorative justice a, a disservice because just the nature of it means you don't have to actually have the forms. And as a victim, I, I'm a survivor. I don't see myself as a victim. But quite often crime victims. And Howard, Mr. Howard Zier, the rocks, he writes about it. For both victims and offenders, we feel like we're told you don't know what you need. So what I hear you saying, Miguel, is that, but we do. We do. We do. And reminding each other that we do, I think, is extremely important. I think it's interesting because I think that that's probably a point of view shared by many people in sort of justice, that uh, the meeting with the offender or the person who harmed you. It's just one of the elements. A lot of the work that uh, can be done to help people get over trauma, for example, mm -hmm. is to do with uh, helping them analyze their feelings about it, which yes. is uh, what you're talking about. Yes. Uh, so you don't need to actually try to, the, the conclusion is not a conference. Uh, the conclusion is two people or one person that uh, are happy again. Pretty much. And, uh, you know, it may be through going through a conference process, maybe it's uh, something different, but uh, that's just one of the elements that could be used uh, in that journey, yes. so to speak. I'm going to ask you about that as well. I said that I'm, I'm doing this interview, <laughs> uh, it's only backwards, because I, I would normally ask you, how did you find restorative justice or did restorative justice find you? And that's going to be my next question, but okay. the one now is about... Uh, uh, being a phoenix and uh, risen from your uh, ashes. And we were talking about this uh, a few moments ago uh, off camera, and it was about how your personal experience can help other people. You told me uh, that uh, at some point in your life, uh, after uh, what happened to you, your mother, uh, your uh, dad got murdered, uh, you stopped finding meaning uh, in your life. 
and and uh, that was a very uh, low point, I suppose. But uh, yes. you rose from it. Yes. Uh, and we talked about you know how a very specific, personal, particular experience could help others. And we talked about your thesis and your books and all that. Can you can you tell me uh, you know what do you feel about that uh, about being able to help other people who might find themselves in similar situations? through your books, through what you're saying, through your speeches and things like that. You want to know something? I'm going to frame it in this way. Because of my journey, which basically, I could say it is encapsulated by story, by other writers, you know, not necessarily speaking about restorative justice, but other writers, their stories of pain, you know, William Shakespeare, Albert Camus, you know, um, Viktor Frankl. Because of these people, I was able to gain a sense of my own worth, for lack of a better phrase. It took a long time, and it does it doesn't always remain. So I go up and down in terms of my value. In terms but like of, everyone, I suppose. So. Yes, yes. <clears throat> but just recently, because of this gift of time and healing with Glenn, who killed Theodore. I, I had an opportunity to meet Desmond Tutu, okay, TRC man, rocks the Casbah. And I asked him, he invited me for coffee, and I said, how? How did you maintain your faith um, in humanity through all of that brutality, all of that brutality? And so, hey, Hello there. hey. hey. Come on. Welcome. We Come. just have a new guest. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hello Hi. there. Andrew, this is Miguel. It's wonderful. He does the resort of Bella Jessica. Miguel. Hello. Hello. That's my partner, Andrew. Yes. Let's 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 show him for a second. <laughs> All right. You're doing an interview there. Yes. Yeah. Perhaps I should leave you to carry on. Oh. Well. It's up to you. You can stay. Yeah, you're welcome to. I, I think that people can see that this is not a usually uh, interview, like I said before. Yeah. It's yeah. more like a conversation. conversation. So I think that we yeah, like to keep it that way. Can you keep focus without me here? Okay. okay. I'll just wait downstairs. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. But just so you have a bit more and let me talk. <gasps> Beautiful. Oh, a present for me. That's very kind of you, Andrew. <laughs> That's very kind. I told you, Miguel is coming. I love these people. <laughs> they come bring gifts, you know, what, what's not to like. I need to break it to you, but. <laughs> I will see about that. <laughs> yeah, I'll mediate. Yeah, and right. um, yeah, so I've got to come back and change shoes and things. Sounds good. All right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so that's very good. Like I said, you know, it's good to, to keep it uh, real. Let's keep it real. <laughs> well, I mean, I will go, I will tell you with, with Desmond Tutu, when I asked him that question, I said, how did you maintain your faith, uh, you know, with all of the brutalities? And then he said to me, he said, I didn't. He said, I didn't do it alone. My community, my friends, my family, they carried me, they, they supported me, and they still do. And what struck me with that is the fact that we can't do any of these things alone. And why the therapeutic writing is extremely, and still is extremely important in my life, is because, yes, I continue to use it for Margot, but yes, I go. I go to prisons, I go to healing centers, I'm at universities, I'm all over the place, and I write with people. Um, I was, uh, two years ago, I was in Brenda Morrison's class, Simon Fraser University. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, exquisite professor, exquisite human being, um, very authentic, very down to earth. She asked me, she said, come and talk about, tell your story. She said, but do the part about reminding people that they have a voice, remind my students they have a voice so that when they're writing about restorative justice, they are really writing from the heart and the bone. And because some of them struggle with it because they think it's horse shit. They think it's crazy. I th I th we're not used to writing about ourselves. I don't exactly, think we are. Exactly, exactly. So, so the, the thing is this, hearing what Desmond Tutu said, along with something else he said to me, which is, you do your journey, said Margot, I did my journey my way. You do your journey your way. That's what Jennifer Llewellyn, another restorative justice, I, I respect her very, very, very much. We've shared astounding kindred conversation. And in at, at one point, 
as I said, there was a point where Glenn and I were castigated because we did not fill out the right forms. Jennifer said to me, she said, Margot, you do it your way. I do it my way. She says, restorative justice needs poetry. It needs therapeutic writing. It needs your voice. It needs many, many, many voices. So part of what gives me strength is the fact that those people who were writing, Jennifer, Brenda, who works diligently with the most beautiful heart you can imagine, authentic, precious heart, you know, um, Arch, all of these people saying, do your voice, do your voice, all of those people that, that, that have helped me, I'll put it in this way, I think, oh my God, Dad, look, you were murdered and you are still help, helping people because you're my dad. So basically, I'm carrying you and you're carrying me. So I feel very grateful, very, very grateful because I said to my dad, I promise you your death will not be for nothing. I was 16 years old. I'm almost 56. And I'm like, dad, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because through that brutality, that through that ugliness, here is your daughter and I offer something back to people. You know what? I, I mentioned this to you before. I think that uh, what's striking, I think what I think what can really help, I'm not going to say the restricted justice community, I'm going to say people. People. Um, young people, perhaps, that live in isolated communities and they, don't, yes. they, they feel that they're different or they have been the victims of something that is endorsed by the community. But, uh, you know, things like that. You have yes. situations situation where you have different pe people that are different from their communities. Yes. And uh, it's a bit like the whole community is not out there to get you, but, uh, you know, you, you can't find support in there. And um, I think that having... Uh, uh, yeah, ac having access to your experience uh, could help them, you know, uh, the way, for example, which is expressed in your writing as well, the way uh, you transform something, an event that was catastrophic for you, that nearly killed you, yes. into something positive where you have managed to um, find a new way to lead your life. You have also helped Glenn uh, to, to, to have a, a new start in his life, I suppose. But I have to tell you this. I have to tell you this, Glenn has helped me. Glenn also helps other people. And this is not a one-sided story. I'm very clear about that. Um, I'm very clear about that. And it's not because I'm you know, being adorable. The fact of the matter is Glenn is a, a hugely, again, authentic person. He knows who he is. He knows what he, what he has done. He did not have to speak with me. He didn't have to care, you know, I mean, Think about it. You murder somebody, basically, you do your time and you walk away. And most of the time you don't want to have anything to do with it again. <laughs> exactly. But that, and that's it. And I must tell you that the, the richness of my life, the paradox and the irony, is that the man who took my dad's life is a huge part in, in sort of making me understand the mystery and the paradox of life. So we each have a different script. Why do we have those scripts? We don't know. So... I am truly grateful uh, to Glenn and for Glenn. You know, we were speaking this morning, or emailing this morning, like we are friends, you know? So it is it is definitely not a one-sided story. I have a way that I do it because words are my métier. That's what I do. I talk, I tell a story, I write, I do this stuff. Huh? Him, he has his way of doing it with the people that he is with and within his community. Sometimes we do it together. To me, it's a hugely... It's kind of mind-blowing, and it's still mind-blowing in my life, but it is not about Margot. It is about Margot and Glenn. It's two of us together, mm -hmm. together, making our choice. We made the choice together, and some people didn't like the choice because we did not fill out the right forms. That has shifted, I think, and I think the beauty is, is that it has shifted, and people ask different conversations now of and from victim-survivors, and of and from offenders. We're not little idiots that don't know what we want. You know, like I can say, what do you need, Miguel? Something happens, I say, what do you need? How can I help you? you that, that's the people aspect, I believe. You have mentioned a couple of times uh, that you didn't fill the right forms. Yes. Uh, and that's curious because uh, I think that that's something that uh, the community is always trying to avoid. Uh, there's this tendency to try to regulate and yes. uh, make everything fit. Uh, form that can be analyzed, you can capture information, then you can uh, uh, analyze it and get conclusions and uh, evaluate it. Yes. I think that's important because uh, you need to be able to provide assurance that uh, the service that uh, people are providing uh, is good, is safe, 
See, uh, absolutely. Uh, you need to have systems in place, but I think that you cannot forget, particularly in restorative justice, you should not forget the fact that it is about people, people that have gone or are going at some sometimes through very traumatic uh, 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 periods in their life. Yes. Uh, so that's that's something I wanted to point it out because it has been mentioned uh, before by some other people to me as well that uh, you know uh, you have that duality. Yes, you need to formalize it. And we need to get to structures and things like that. But at the same time, it's what you say, you know, uh, not feeling the right forms should not be an impediment for you to get the proper service. And I'm not even going to say service. What do you need? Support. Exactly. Right? The support. And I think, again, I mean, trust me, this is a huge, it continues to be a huge learning process for me. Because one of the, one of the factors, a very important factor that, I, I can forget sometimes, I think each of us have a tendency to forget, mm -hmm. is that we're still human, right? So sometimes you connect better with, uh, with some people than you do with other people. So even if somebody wanted perhaps to um, support you in your journey, they may not suit you. They just, they may, they may be saying all the right, like I might be saying all the right things, but I might be pissing someone off so badly, they want nothing to do with me. As a human being, I have to bow to that, and vice versa. Like I mean, I like their vibes, so I might I want to do my stuff with them, and I think that those are important things, even in restorative community, like the you know this um, community of, of restorative researchers that you know we're part of. You know, not everyone is has the same sort of essence with each other, and it goes back as well. You see, Glenn and I, we are very kindred. Even before we met and we started to write to each other, we knew that there was a possibility, we, we, more than a possibility, I already had a sense that he was going to be who I thought he was going to be, and vice versa. So what, what the, the, the point that I'm also trying to say is that if we have different services, different supports, different ways of articulating justice as a lived experience, hence Sabona, then, you know, I might come to you and say, well, I really want to meet blah, 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 and then I realize, hmm. Mm. You're not like getting on, man. And so we have to bow to that, you know, acknowledging we don't have the same vibe, man. What are the other services and supports that are offered for each of us? You know, I mean, it's painful when somebody doesn't like who you are. Well, it's the truth. But it's a matter of life. <laughs> yes. Well, exactly. So it has to be like within this crucible, within this context, mm -hmm. there has to be a, a, a deep, deep, like you say, safety and trust. And I think that the homework never stops for restorative justice, never stops within, within the context of Sabona as well. We cannot pretend that we are bigger than big. You know, I've, I've, I've witnessed within communities that are doing restorative justice articulating. You know, it's not always warm and fuzzy and... Well, it's a learning process, I think. It's, yeah, it's oh, still early days. I, I belong, I must tell you, I'm, I'm um, an associate to the uh, Congregation of St. Joseph. So Sister Helen Frejan the nun, that the movie that my walking is based on. Okay. So I've done work with Helen. Actually, she wrote... The, yeah, that's yeah. what I was looking at. I was looking at your book. You got it there. <laughs> yeah, she wrote the quote. But this is before we even knew that we would do work together. Yeah. But I spent time in, in my... I will say my community. It's in the States, and I, I don't spend as much time with them at this point. But at one point, I, I've, I've gone there for a few times to do some work. You know, I tell I tell the Sabona story. Helen talks about anti-capital punishment, eh? But in that community, I spoke with some of the nuns, wonderful women. But they, they say to me, they said to me, they said, but in here, we have the same thing too. We don't like everybody. We're nuns. We have a big cross. We're like all holier. But this humanity, you see. And sometimes for me, not I, I will phrase it in a positive way. Yeah. In restorative justice and within the context of, of Sabona, I see your humanity. It also means I see, Margo, you're a pain in the butt. You're annoying. Give it up. Marco, you're loyal and kind and, and authentic. You know, like, we are a mixture of all of these things. Mm -hmm. And and I think it's very important to continue to acknowledge that and not to turn restorative justice, as you wisely and eloquently say, into a system. The second we become a system, then we lose respect, responsibility, and relationship. Because now... Relationship, we have, yes. <laughs> yeah, we have check marks. You can't tell... And somebody. targets. And targets, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's again, that sense of, well, funding is a huge part of it, right? 
Yes. <laughs> so if somebody's going to give you cash, they want to make sure that whatever they're giving you cash for, you're going to have uh, a something to show, you know, like. So those things I understand. I understand that. At the same time, I think it is extremely important to not lose the people, the heart, with colleagues, with colleagues, mm-hmm. with communities, with our very own self, like our very, our very, very own self. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, th- I think we, we do have the risk uh, when we formalize things to to go for outputs rather than for outcomes. Yes. And, uh, uh, yeah, <coughs> that's okay. <coughs> And it, it happens a lot, uh, like you said. You know, those providing the cash want to see the numbers, and they want to see the numbers, not people, not outcomes. <laughs> no, and it's I mean it's it's a balance, and I think that that again that's one of the beauties of the restorative just the restorative, uh, I guess, um, sort of like the practices, sort mm-hmm. of like the framing. You know, I mean, I mentioned to you, you know, when I was in South Africa, I also I gave a little talk. A short, short few words at the um, for the World Bank through the um, the International Finance uh, Committee, mm-hmm. and then you know that sounds weird. Even into my ears, it's weird. Why? But the reason is, is because within that context, my partner is in that context of um, of extractive industries, and within that context, his colleagues, some of his colleagues, know what I do. So they said, oh, could you come and speak for a few moments on justice within this area? I found that deeply, deeply moving. I was scared out of my mind because it, that's not really my world. It is Andrew's world, but that, that's fine. It's not my world. However, what I did is precisely what you just did. Again, I admire and respect it. I thought, these are people just like me. We are all people. Mm-hmm. We are all people. Justice matters to us no matter where we are. And there's also something else I, I'm going to share. I, I've said this, I'll be quite clear about this. I have a very, very deep faith. I also do not have my faith in a system and in a box. Uh, you know. So when I do my talks, my work, whatever it is I do, when I get very scared, when I get nervous, when I'm not certain, I remind myself, it's not about you. You are you are blessed. You, you are given a voice and... You, you, you were given an opportunity to write and to speak, but you didn't make you. And remember, whatever you are doing, it's in relation to something that is vaster. So my fear went that day because I was scared, I must tell you. I just thought, <gasps> and then I thought, no, you're, you're, if you're really scared, it's about your ego. And ego is okay because it gives but us courage. I have to slightly disagree with you here. <laughs> tell me. I, I tell think me. that, uh, yes, you, you are who you are. Uh, but uh, you have also worked hard to give yourself a platform to uh, express uh, what you want to express. So, you know, I'm not going to say that, uh, obviously, you know, uh, we don't do these things alone and we depend on other people as yes. well. And uh, uh, we rel- very often rely on other people being uh, uh, kind to us and helping us. Yes. But, but you know, you did something, you know, you said, right, this is a situation, this is what I want to do, and this is what I want to express, and you have found a way, whether writing or making contacts, networking, things like that. So, you know, it is something. A lot of people, a lot of people, you know, are happy with just being able to heal themselves, and that's it. And in your case, you you, you must have felt the need to, to share with others and try to help others. So that's in itself something good as well, because you did something about it, rather than just keep it to yourself. I think it is very good that you decided and felt the need to share with others. Okay. And you know <laughs> My what, opinion. <laughs> but you, know what's real, you know what? You know what? What do you say? You have worked, you say, you have worked on building a platform or creating a platform. And yes, I have, and I do. Still connected to that is a sense that, you know, I mean, I meditate. Uh, I'm not a big fancy of it. I walk like a madman. That is my meditation, right? So I walk and I just say, all right, heavens, world, life, tell me what you want me to do. And the way that I'm going to be able to know is when I'm doing it, if I feel absolutely connected to, you know, this authentic self that people talk about, you know, um, who is it? Um, 
Campbell, Campbell, we know the man that writes about, well, Carl Jung, Joseph Campbell, these people are also part of my, they're in my little black bag. So part of what, I mean, I, I agree with what you say. I, I, I am tenacious. I'm tenacious because I believe that story matters, because I believe that what happened to my father will go with me to my grave. Every day I miss my father. I make no bones about that. I make no bones. I have four grandchildren, which means my dad has four great grandchildren. And I think, geez, I wish dad could see them. And I think, all right, that's, that's true. You do, Margo. However, we each have a script. Theodore and Glenn had a script and they met each other and they played their script. You as a writer, as a speaker, as a healer, you have a script. You write your script, you walk your script. And so when I walk and I'm, I'm gonna use the word, I have to use it, I, I, I use it and I'm shy to use it, but when I walk and I pray, that is what I say. I say, heavens, I have this voice that you have given me. I do network, weave connections, it happens. The story is what makes those things happen. I aggravate some people because I knock on doors and they say, go to hell. That happens maybe 2% of the time. The rest people say, come, you know, we want to hear it. So yes, I will take what you say with gratitude and I will bow to it because yes, I am determined and I'm tenacious because my dad has not died for nothing. And that is my essential goal, my essential goal. He loved us very, very much, my mom, all of us, my sisters, my brother. So everything that I do, I think, okay. Okay, today I'm scared. Today I feel small. Today I feel silly. But I think, Dad, no. I got you covered. That's how I think. And that makes me feel happy. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not. You told me that you cried earlier today. And then here you yes. are. About to again. Yes. Uh, I'm going to ask you the last questions. Because I know that you have a, a meeting uh, yes. uh, right in a few minutes. With one of our colleagues right here. Yay. There you go. Yes. Well, that's London to you. It's um, beautiful. The last question is the one that I tend to ask first, is uh, um, how do you get, how do you find restorative justice or how did restorative justice find you? How do you get to know about this and get involved? Oh, this, is the, this is the crazy, wonderful thing about story, about writing your voice. So, I moved from Ontario to Calgary, Calgary, Alberta, so I get there, I start to give workshops on therapeutic writing. I'm sitting, I was giving a workshop one day, packed room, lots and lots of people. They're there to write their voice. Well, nobody was writing. They were just, when I explained what the process was, I don't think they'd done it, they had done it before. They, they came out of curiosity. They were not writing, you know. So I said, um, I said, look, when I tell you that writing your voice can save your life, can give you your life back, I'm not joking. This is the truth. This is the truth. I said to them two days ago, the man who murdered my father emailed me because he read about my book, The Answer to Healing, Tears at the Beginning. He read about my therapeutic writing. People were going, oh, everyone was writing. But a woman sitting in the back of the class, Sherry Lockwood, now a dear friend, who wrote the foreword to one of my books, um, it's called The Other Inmate, uh, Mediating Justice, Mediating Hope. That is a poetry and a workbook for restorative practice use in prison, use all over the place. At any rate, Sherry at that time, I didn't know her from a hole in the wall. She goes, I have to talk to you. Long story short, she invited me because she is a professor and she works at the Remand Center in Calgary. She said, would you please come, come to the Remand Center, Margaret, and write with the fellows there. That was two days after the email came. She picked me up from my house a week later and we're driving to the Remand Center, you know, and I said, you know, a long time ago, I heard about this thing where if you want to, um, if if you want to be with the person uh, that that has done you harm, there's some like process or program or something like I don't know what it's called, but it sounds like really groovy. And Sherry Lockwood told me about restorative justice. I said, "Oh, so it has a name? Oh, that's really groovy." Then I started to do research, find out all kinds of things, and from that moment, the networking. The weaving of connections began, and then I will tell you I got a bee in my bonnet because I thought, wait a minute, I'm reading everybody, but I don't, I'm not, they're all telling me what I should do, and maybe, but 
and I'm, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to qualify it by saying I don't mean to be rude to anybody, but what <laughs> drove me crazy was, but I'm not reading of anybody like an, a researcher that's maybe had their dad murdered or something. I know everyone has pain, so I know that, but I'm like, but they're kind of talking about this stuff, but holy shoes, I know, I know a particular point of view. And that's what then took me to the to doing a master's because I had ended up, I, I did connect with um, Correctional Services Canada, Tanya Petrellis, uh, Manon Bach, astounding young ladies that just are so committed and exquisite. Um, and then I, then I thought, okay, I gave talks, you know, and then I thought, no, but something's still missing. And my mom always says, you can complain about something once. You can complain twice. The third time, you find or you create the solution you want. Hence, at the age of 50, a master's thesis, Sabona, justice is lived experience. Fleshing out, teasing out, articulating, dancing with the likes of Howard Zier, Brenda Morrison, Jennifer Llewellyn, astounding people, and going, oh my God, I, I understand it. I understand their perspective. I understand different perspectives. And yes, I can bring something. And my head supervisor, yes, I name drop like a son of a gun. And the reason I do is because this is humanity. Huh? Mm -hmm. So Dale Dewhurst, I had two supervisors for my master's thesis. Carolyn Riddell, auto ethnography expert, expert. And then, but I told my department what I wanted to do. And they said, oh boy, that's going to be a problem. They found me two supervisors. Car well, Carolyn offered to be my supervisor and a lawyer, Dale Dewhurst, lawyer professor who absolutely believes in alternative route to justice. And he just, oh, he made me, you see that paper that I had to write? I had to rewrite, I had to rewrite my proposal eight times because Dale said to me, no, people, they're gonna want something solid, Margaret. It's autoethnography and it's restorative justice. If it's not solid, people aren't gonna give a crap. And then I also said to him, he knew I wanted to meet them. I want to meet justice ministers, which I have. I've met all kinds of people now. But he said, if you want those people to believe that there is a worth to what you have to offer, you make it so solid they can't tell you. So that's probably way too much of an answer. But I came to it because of story, because of voice, because of in insisting that I was going to stay alive after Daddy was killed, which I almost didn't when I was 18. I almost took my life because I thought, do I need? Well, I was reading three books, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, Man's Search for Meaning, and No Man is an Island. And it was Viktor Frankl's book, actually, Man's Search for Meaning, when I read that, because I was balancing three books, three books. When I read Viktor Frankl, and I just thought, and of course reading about the Holocaust, you know, I thought, I am human. There is no reason on the face of the earth why I would not put a bullet in someone's head, someone's back, someone's shoulder. There's no reason, you know. So what makes us do the script we have? So I thought I would kill myself, which I, I came sort of close. <laughs> Clearly it didn't work because I didn't want to be participating in that brutality. Um, and yes, I'm alive. And the ironic part is when my mom came to the hospital after they pumped my stomach out, all of 36, she said, uh, 30, she was 38 at that time. She said, Margo, I have lost daddy. I cannot lose you. And then I realized, yeah, murdering yourself is brutality as well. <laughs> against others. Of, against others. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I have told you before, uh, the sun's gone, but yes. I have told you before, yes. I love the way you, you express yourself. Thank uh, you. And I actually love the same from your mother as well, you know, that you have to find a solution. Uh, a solution or create or it created. yourself. Or I created. think that's that's something that we should apply to ourselves. Uh, you know, I think it's yes. a, a very good one. Well, thank you. And thank you for wanting to hear this. And thank you for actually hearing what I have been uh, doing. Because sometimes it's very daunting. Sometimes I feel very scared. Um, sometimes I just feel scared. I think I'm doing it the wrong way. You know, I mentioned the documentary film, all this kind of stuff. But I think... Maybe I'm crazy, you know, or maybe there's a better way to do this. But as I said, I, I have a very deep faith and I have a very deep commitment to my father as well as my mother, by the way, because I, w I would like to t share something before we say goodbye. About the second day after my dad was killed, and it was two people that shot him, but three people involved in that uh, robbery. So my mom was 36 when my father was killed. Daddy was 40. My mom is Bridget, by the way. 
um, it was a very big robbery. That is the reason it got a lot of, it's not because my dad was anything bigger, none of us were anything big, just, but it was a huge robbery in uh, Canada at that time. So a reporter, many reporters were there, camped out the house, like it was like crazy, craziness. But a young reporter came to the door, female reporter, and she wanted to interview. Many of them came, but we all said no. But I entered the door this time, and it was a female. And uh, she asked if she could, uh, you know, speak to my mom and my big sister and I. There are four of us, but Lorette and I are like the big chiefs. So we said, um, we told everybody no, but her, I said to my mom, I said, Mom, I said, you know that I'm thinking of becoming a journalist. And maybe one day I will want to ask questions like this. I mean, maybe you should speak to her. Just, can you imagine my mom just lost her, the love of her life? So mommy said yes. Reporter is sitting, mom is here, Loretta, Margot, you know, reporter. So the reporter said, will you ever be able to forgive the man who murdered your husband? My mom is 36, was 36 years old, okay? This is my mother. And people ask about, you know, yes, but did your family do what you do, Margot? And, Oh my God, and la, like implying somehow that the fact that I have met Glenn somehow I'm bigger than. This is what my mom said. I forgive him so I can live. So I can live. And then my mom, she has a very, a very clear faith. Um, she said, There is a higher power that will take care of the rest, but I need to live, so I forgive him. That was two days after a 36 year old woman's husband, love of her life, was killed. You know what? I love that sort of way of expressing uh, and, and, and living, in fact. You know, that way of living and thinking, you know, you, you need to get on and, and you need to forgive. Yeah. Yeah. It is not my language. And I, I did not forgive Glenn. Life and grace gave that opportunity. I do not believe in that. Mom and I don't have that same languaging. I don't have it. But I know other people do. And I love it. Grace offered me that opportunity. It happened. I, I don't know if I could use that. I could say it now, but I did. But it was grace mm -hmm. and life that gave that. So this is great. Thank you for the work that you do. This is this is crucial, crucial, generous work. So thank you. Well, thank you for having me here. Uh, London rain. Yes. <laughs> we got it now. So it's raining. <laughs> uh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, thank you very, very much for watching this. And uh, I'll include uh, links to your obviously to your thesis, which is sure. already online, but also to your books as well, in case sure. people are interested. If you have any workshops, let us know as well. Absolutely. Because uh, we have people from Canada, from the States as well, uh, who might be interested in attending. I think that they're sure. really interesting. Sure. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, well, I, th I thought it went well. <laughs>